Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. A um, few announcements for today. Um, Pastor Daniel is with us today in person, um, and he's going to be going over uh, continuing the membership study class for Sunday school after the service. Um, our weekly uh, studies are going on as usual. Uh, Mondays, 6.30 is the ladies' study, and we're uh, still working out where that's going to be, right? Yeah. Probably at our house, but we will let you know. Men's study is Wednesdays at 6.30, and we're going to do that at your office or at Matt? I shall be gone this week. You're gone this week. So it's up right. to you. Okay, fair enough. I will text the group and let everyone know where we're going. Um, there's a handful of books on the back table. Um, there's a couple extra books for the men's study. There's a couple of John Leonard's books. And Daniel brought some uh, books of Easter stories from Grace Sacramento. So please take one if you're interested in any of those. Um, speaking of John Leonard, uh, we sent out those uh, surveys the last two weeks. We got 18 responses. It was unanimously, yes, we would like him to come here. Um, so we will continue uh, talking to him and figuring out the logistics and if that's even possible. Um, a couple of the questions that were on there that we got, um, most of you guys were concerned about, or most of the questions were comments about whether or not we can actually afford to pay for him to be here. Um, and we will definitely be working through those details. Um, I don't have the answer for that yet, but, but we're, wor we're working through that with, with him and we'll be talking to the uh, Presbytery, I'm sure, at some point as well. Um, one other question was, how long do we expect him to be here if he was to come? And he had told Armand and I that their plan is to retire in the next, with, uh, after five years. So they're thinking if they were to come, they would be here in the fall if, they, if, we, if everything works out, and then they would be here for five years before they retire. Um, and last thing that I had was, oh, I've started a YouTube channel, and there's a link to it from the website if you guys are interested. Um, we've started recording the sermons. The video and audio quality isn't that great but it is it is recorded and we're, we're posting those so if um just for future reference if you're unable to attend those are being posted now um and with that take a few moments to um prepare to worship and and daniel will call us to worship in a minute actually i will be oh armand's gonna be doing that sorry As we're called to worship this morning, let these words from Psalm 57, 5, 7 through 11, awaken our minds and hearts to pour out our praise to our Savior and God who reigns over all. Would you please stand with me if you are able and join me in reading the verses in bold found in your bulletin. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Awake, my soul, awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's open up to hymn number 295, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
next hymn is hymn number 302, Come Christians Join to Sing. hard to market ourselves on social media in routine conversations. We airbrush our own stories. We master image management. The thought that someone sees us with complete access to our thoughts and words and behaviors is beyond bearing unless it's God. Today we remember that again that God sees us, he knows us, and by the miracle of God's grace, he loves us. God cleanses us and restores us through Christ's death and resurrection. We fight the temptation to hide our sin and instead acknowledge it openly to God. But we do so in light of the grace that is ours in Jesus. And so let's confess our sins and hear his assurance this afternoon. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, in raising your son Jesus from the grave, you broke the power of sin and death. We thank you that we have been burned living hope through his resurrection yet lord we confess that we often live as if the resurrection never happened in the face of suffering and hardship we often look for hope where it can't be found or harden our hearts in cynicism and despair forgive us through the death of your son enable us by your spirit to know the hope and joy of resurrection life given in jesus christ our risen Lord. Amen. Would you just take a moment in silent reflection, confessing your sin before God? Friends, hear these words of assurance from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let's stand one more time and sing Afflicted Saints to Christ Draw Near, found in your bulletin.
standing and Ben will come up and lead us in the profession of faith. Our profession of faith today is from the Nicene Creed. It's found on page 846 in your hymnals. What do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. If you've been in the church long enough, and especially these kinds of churches, you know, Presbyterian churches, we, we practice a liturgy. It's, uh, in the Latin, the works of the people. Because we think that when we come to church, it's not just you know, those who are up on the stage who do the work of, of gospel ministry. We think it's all of us, both uh, those who are facing you and those who are facing this way. And so part of that work is a, a prayer. We pray together. This is an important work that we do together as a church because we think there's power in prayer, especially when People gather to pray together. There's power there. So during the season of Easter tide, these 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, we remember that uh, what Christ accomplished for us in his death and resurrection and how that reshapes how we pray for ourselves, how we pray for others. And so this afternoon, would you join me in prayer? Again, as I pray and as I say the words, Lord, in your mercy, if you would respond with the words, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Passover Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Just as the, as the prophets prophesied, just as you had promised, Jesus, you rose again and you are reigning. Lord, you love us way more than we will ever love you. And we believe that your love calls, it frees and empowers us to love others more than they love us. Jesus, after your resurrection, you walked among us. You appeared to those who needed to see you and touch you and walk with you and to believe you. You appeared to his disciples, to your disciples, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And Jesus, you came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And so we ask today that you would bring your peace like you did to, the, uh, to, those, uh, to those of old, that you would bring that good peace, that good news to the world now. Especially in places of war, we pray that uh, in places like Ukraine, that you would bring peace. We pray for those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. And so we ask, Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. You appeared to Mary Magdalene as she, she wept outside the tomb where you were laid. She wasn't ready to stop crying yet. She stood there brokenhearted, distraught, and, dis and in disbelief, that is, until you said her name. 
And those tears of sadness and grief turned to tears of joy inexpressible. And so we pray that you would comfort the lonely, the grieving, and those who aren't ready to stop crying. Comfort them with the peace of your presence. Lord, in your mercy. You came to a doubting Thomas. He needed to see in your hands the mark of the nails and touch your hands and side to believe. Thomas wanted to know for himself what others had been telling him. And yet, Lord, you didn't rebuke him. You did not humiliate him. You said to him, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So reassure those who are troubled by doubt. We ask, Lord, that you will strengthen their faith in your goodness and love. Lord, in your mercy. You met the woman who had come to prepare your body for burial. You said to them, do not be afraid and go tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And so we ask, guide your followers everywhere that they, by their life and words, will be a witness of the resurrection and proof of your love for the world. May the world know that we are disciples of Jesus by our love for one another. Lord, in your mercy. As you made yourself known to your disciples by the breaking of the bread, reveal yourself to us as we too will break bread together. Strengthen and nourish our faith. Renew your covenant with us. And remind us that we are yours, united to you. Remind us of that day when we'll dine with you at the banqueting table, Lord, in your mercy. And so we ask this through your risen Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This afternoon I have the privilege of uh, preaching from Luke chapter 24. And so if you would stand from where you are, Luke 24. Verses 13, and I apologize in advance, but I will stop at verse 27. And so if you keep reading, that's okay, <laughs> but we're going to stop. Uh, Luke 24, 13 through 27. And so if you're looking at the bulletin, it's that first paragraph. Um, and so we'll read this. Uh, I'll read this for us. This is the reading of God's word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking, I'm sorry, they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from, re from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his, find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went, in, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Be you may all be seated. If I didn't introduce myself before, my name is Daniel, one of the pastors at a church uh, about 130 miles away uh, in Sacramento. Uh, it's warm in Sacramento. It's perfect in Reno. I just want to make that comparison known to all of you. Uh, but before I, I go into the word here this afternoon, let me just share a quick story. There was a, a new pastor in town. A new pastor would come into a, a new church, uh, and so he thought he'd visit his parishioners, his members of his congregation, before he preached that uh, Sunday morning. And so he went to one particular house, knocked on the door, and certainly someone was there. There was noise from inside the house, and yet no one answered the door. 
He knocked again and yet no one answered. And so he pulled out his business card. He wrote on the back of that business card, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Now, if you have that memorized, like I did when I was in college, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it if I don't read it from, uh, from the text here, but Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. And so he left that business card at the door. And on Sunday morning, uh, as the offering basket was passed around at the very end, as they were counting the money, there was a, a note in that offering basket. And it had the, the reference, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. So now again, these are, these are bookends, right? Revelation is the last book of the Bible, and, and, the, and Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And again, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, it says, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. <laughs> I thought I'd just share that funny story. Uh, I, I know I'm, I, you may have seen me on Zoom or on a, on a face, a big face up here, uh, but I'm, you may think, you know, you're shorter than I, I remember. But again, I, I'm here, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm here with my daughter this this weekend, and, uh, and it's been wonderful. And so thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the warm welcome and the hospitality. Um, but um, just excited to be here and excited to hear about what's happening with Grace Reno and all the, the wonderful plans that are in place. And so we'll, we'll ask God to, to uh, fulfill those uh, plans in our, in our midst here. But before we get started, would you pray with me uh, as we start in the, our time in the Word of God? Uh, Lord, we know that your Word is precious. Lord, there's there's truth in your word that we need to hear. And so, God, as your word is preached, God, we pray that you would convict our heart. Not any words, Lord, spoken by me or any other preacher. We ask, Lord, that we would hear from your word as we read it and that that word would take effect and transform us from the inside out. God, we pray that you would, that you would speak as you do uh, in a way that only you can. And so, Father, I pray that we would hear those words today. We thank you for this time together. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a, a note on my Facebook feed. Um, an old college student of mine, actually two, husband and wife were both students at the time, they married, had two beautiful boys, and uh, as I was scrolling through Facebook yesterday, I came across her post, and I thought I'd just read you the first paragraph of that long post, but she says, it's been two days since Avery passed. He was four and a half years old. I never knew the days could be so long every minute. My goal is to just make it to the next minute. And everything seems wrong. It mainly, it, I've mainly been trying to keep busy because when I'm too still at home, I feel the weight of my grief surrounding me entirely. But then when I'm, not, when I'm out trying to keep O, who is the older brother, the older sibling, happy and distracted, if I manage to get out of my own head for a second and give him a genuine smile, I'm consumed with guilt. How can I smile and feel happiness for even a second when my baby is gone? I'm not sure how to continue to live. I'm trying, but I just honestly don't know how to keep putting one foot in front of the other. I guess all I can do is keep trying. It's pretty sad. It's pretty dark. I had a chance to encourage her uh, and send her a message, but uh, he... Uh, Avery passed away, was diagnosed with, uh, again, I don't even know what the diagnosis is. Uh, it's a, uh, alveolar, uh, and I'm butchering it, rhabdomersacoma. It's a, a tumor of the pineal gland of his brain. And again, it's just, just suddenly, I mean, he was healthy just a, a couple of months ago. In a matter of a couple of months, he, he passed. Why do I share that story? Uh, such a difficult intro, such a sorrowful illustration on such a glorious Sunday. 
especially as we celebrated uh, last week the glory of our risen Lord, right? It's Easter Sunday, and it's, and it's a, a time you celebrate the celebration of a, of a risen Christ who did not stay dead but rose again from the dead. Why share such a sorrowful and, and difficult illustration? Well, to go back to that Easter Sunday, it's Easter Sunday and there's no joy. As you're reading through the text, no joy for Cleopas and this other disciple as they make their way from Jerusalem, again, seven miles to a place called Emmaus. Instead of proclaiming a message of, of victory, of a risen Savior, we find these two disciples in retreat. They're hiding a walk of sadness and, and gloom. They're dejected and confused and perhaps a little disappointed. They don't have the answers. They're without the comfort of, of hope. These two men were conversing, perhaps even consoling one another. And what's interesting is what, were they, uh, what they were discussing. The text tells us they were talking about all the things that had taken place. Their conversation was centered around the death, burial, and reports of the resurrection of Christ, a wonderful topic of conversation and one which would have brought joy and hope and a sense of victory and purpose, but instead it brings sadness and retreats and a sense of deep loss. This is a remarkably vivid account, uh, so vivid and rich with, uh, with minute detail that some say there's no way that Luke could have written this. Was he there to have witnessed this at the resurrection of Jesus? Again, some scholars might say, well, it's written in such vivid detail. It has such uh, minute details there in Luke 24 that perhaps Luke was there. We're not sure. And we might even speculate that perhaps Luke was that other disciple who was walking with Cleopas. Who knows? But they were consoling one another. They had spent so much time with Jesus. The other disciples of Jesus had spent so much time with, with Jesus, and they asked probably uh, this question, uh, how could this have happened? How have we come to this? If Jesus was truly the Son of God, how could this have happened? They were disappointed who felt their faith slipping away with every step on the road to Emmaus. They heard the rumors of an empty tomb, but what does that mean? No one had seen Jesus yet, or so they assumed. There comes a time in life when you have to deal with the facts and deal with reality. And so ends the sad tale of Jesus, a story that has had such promising beginnings. They believed in Jesus and he let them down. The third day was almost gone and yet Jesus was nowhere to be found. Uh, bring down the curtain. It's all over now. And it's Sunday morning and Jesus is gone. My friends, this is what Good Friday looks like without Easter. Without the resurrection, the cross is nothing but a tragedy. A story without a moral, a drama that ends before the final act. And these two disciples on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem, I mean, that's their story. That's what they understand of the gospel, is that Jesus Christ, the promising, um, the promise of, of new life and the promise of a new Israel and the promise of a new nation with a new king, the promise of victory and, and a promise of, of freedom from their oppressors, the, the, the freedom of, of new life under a, a new regime is all gone. It's all thrown away. And again, when you look at the Bible story and you don't look at the, the Easter story of Christ rising again, again from the dead, then it's just the Good Friday service. It's just the Good Friday story. It's just a story with no hope. So we're looking at this resurrection because I think the resurrection is one of the most important, if not the most important event 
on which the Christian faith makes its claim. On everything is hinged uh, this resurrection of Jesus. Did Jesus really die and rise again from the dead? Now let me tell you, my friends, uh, there is a very significant life experience lesson that we need to learn from this. Uh, when we are in circumstances in our lives which tempt us to think that God has thrown us a curveball, that the rug has been pulled out from under us, and that there is no hope, that we have been consigned to, a, to misery that we don't deserve, that somehow God's plan has failed, we are exactly where the disciples were. All the lights have gone out for them. When you're in a circumstance that you did not want, but you have, or if there is a circumstance that you have longed with, for all, well, longed for with all your heart and you don't have it, and you think that God has thrown you a curveball, again, you're in the same place as these two disciples on the road to, uh, road to Emmaus. They looked at these different events and looked at the death of the prophet and Messiah, who they loved, and they thought, God, you've thrown us a curveball not realizing that God has one up his sleeve as well. In this event, which they see as the end of the world, God has revealed his power and using it as a strategy, tragedy, strategy, strategy to display the glory of his redemption. When we look at this story, again, we, we're left hopeless. If we find ourselves like the disciples did on the road to Emmaus, this dark and gloomy story that has such a sad end. But we know there's more to the story. As a theologian, let me give you the brief outline of, uh, of Luke 24, kind of in my words. This is my, uh, this is my outline. My outline is there were two men walking, and then there's three men walking, and then there's two men walking. That's my story. That's my outline. Um, I'm not a theologian by any means, I don't think. But it's interesting, there's these two men who are making their way to a, towards uh, Emmaus, and somewhere along the journey, a third person joins them, and all of a sudden he disappears, and there's two men again. On that very day, it says in verse 13, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, they're again seven miles from Jerusalem, and they're talking, and then again a, a third person shows up and says, what is this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk. I clearly see myself there. I almost see myself as a, uh, a third wheel when it comes to my own family. Uh, they always have this conversation without me. I always walk in at the very end of that, and I always say, what are you talking about? And I might even say it the same way. What is this conversation that you are holding with each other? And uh, they, they don't even clue me in. They don't even tell me after I ask. It's uh, pretty pitiful. I'm, I'm the fifth, you know, the fifth to know about things in my own family. And again, it's, uh, it's this clueless person, it seems, like uh, uh, asking the question, like, well, what are you guys talking about? And Jesus comes and, and walks along them and asks this question, what is it that you're holding this conversation about? And again, uh, these, these disciples on the road to Emmaus said, are you the only visitor? Right? I mean, are you the only one in all of Israel or all of Jerusalem to not know what's happening? And Jesus says to them, what things? In some ways, I think Jesus wants them to say it in their own words. What are you talking about? What do you believe about what you've heard? What are those rumors that are happening and, and what do you believe about them? What do you think actually happened? Again, it's more than just a recalling of details and a recalling of an event. I mean, many of us can, can tell the stories, but what Jesus, I think, is, is, is getting at is not what, not what you know, but what you believe. And you get that sense when he's asking them, what things? I mean, the same thing happens in the book of Genesis. And again, I mentioned uh, the, uh, Adam and Eve uh, embarrassed by their sin and, and hiding before God. They were, they were naked in the garden, they, so they, they hid themselves. And in a loud voice, you can hear in the Garden of Eden, perhaps a, a God calling out to Adam, Adam, which I think is the most ridiculous question in all of the scriptures, God asking Adam, where are you? <laughs> 
Because I know God sees all things. I'm sure God is looking down at the garden, and he, he certainly can see the, the, the layout of, of that which he created. And yet, in the midst of this place that he had created, and who sees all and, and knows all, asking this, this silly question, Adam, where are you? And I think in the same way, and you, when you read through Luke 24, the very last chapter of this book, Jesus, as he walks with the disciples, asks, what things? And he's not asking you to recall what the gospel is and tell us and, and give us an outline of, of Genesis to Revelation. Tell me what you know about the Bible. Tell me what you understand about the scriptures. Give me your theology, your systematic or biblical theology of, of what you know about, about the scriptures. Perhaps when, we, when this life is over, um, God will ask us the question, a theological question, a theological test to get into heaven. I don't think so. I hope not. No, but it's a very simple question. What things? Because I think Jesus wants us to, to answer that all these things were about you. All the things that you did, all the things that you said, you did. All those things that you prophesied, you, it, it came true. You said it, and then you did it. You know, uh, and I know I'm using a lot of baseball terminology here, but it's almost like a Babe Ruthian pointing to the stands and saying, I'm going to hit it there. Babe Ruth was a home run hitter, and he would often point to the outfield stands, and then he, he would hit those uh, over the fence. And it almost seems like Jesus make that kind of Babe Ruthian type of prediction about himself. Well, oh, I'm going to die, and then in three days I'm going to rise again. I mean, he, he, he says it, and then he, he does it. There's two men, and there's, there's three men, and there's two men again. And, and Jesus asked, what things? What things? And he asks us, what things? What do you believe about who Jesus is? Because again, when you look at these two disciples, they don't really know what's going on. Because again, perhaps, 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 their expectations don't match what he had said. We may be disappointed with God because our expectations do not match God's sovereign purpose. I mean, there's questions, yes. Why, where did he go? Why did he leave us? And we're left there with disappoint, disappointment and discouragement and dismay, but, but, but why? Because sometimes our expectations don't match his sovereign purpose. We have a different idea of what Jesus is right? or, or what Jesus should be to us. We have different thoughts about, about who he is, that he should be just a giver, right? He should just, he should just give us good gifts. We have different expectations about how, how fair life should be. That nothing ever bad should happen to good people. We have that kind of theology. A lot of us do. Our expectations don't match what God wants to do. And what God does for his own glory. What God does for his sovereign purpose. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes, uh, again, we, these things happen because we, we forget what he promised. I mean, how often have, have you and I been in some sort of struggle and forgot to look back on the word of God? How often have we remembered his promises and, and yet we forget them in our darkest hour? We forget what he promises. Or, 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 or sometimes our, our timing is off. We don't have it all figured out. And, and those things that happen, happen in his time and, and not ours. And God, we say, God, you promised. And, and yet it's in his timing that he works out all things. I mean, isn't this true with, with prayer? How we pray, how God gives, uh, how God will answer sometimes in a, in a yes or a no or later. And oftentimes when we pray, we, we certainly expect that God would answer now. Sometimes we can't recognize him. And again, it says so in verse 16 that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why didn't they know it was Jesus? After all, they were his disciples. There are many answers given to, uh, to this, but again, maybe a supernatural veiling of their eyes so that they saw just a man 
but did not know it was Jesus. Sometimes uh, God veils our eyes so that we don't see the full picture. Or God keeps us ignorant because, again, his sovereign purposes are too great for us. I found this neat little, um, little excerpt in uh, Philip Yancey's book, uh, Disappointment with God. Uh, Philip Yancey, a writer, he used to be the uh, editor of uh, Christianity Today. He, he writes the, in his book, Disappointment with God, he says, uh, why God keeps us ignorant. Two reasons why. He says, first, perhaps God keeps us ignorant because enlightenment might not help us. I love that. If God gave you the answer, I mean, if, if you ever asked the question, uh, why do the stars shine at, you know, at night in the, in the bright sky or in the dark sky? And some nuclear physicist or uh, astronomer, uh, I don't even know, <laughs> some scientist, right, uh, try to explain uh, why things work the way they do. I mean, would you understand it? Or some uh, uh, engineer who talks about the, the way a bridge is built and, and what happens in these different parts and, and how a bridge can hold all these different cars because of the suspensions and the, and the supports and the beams. And again, I'm not, a, I'm not that either. But if someone were to explain that to you, would you really understand it? And Philip Yancey in his book says that we don't understand everything because, again, if he tells us the answer, we might go, huh? God, I don't really understand that either. Number two, he says, God keeps us ignorant because perhaps uh, we're incapable of comprehending the answer. Uh, he says, imagine uh, yourself trying to communicate with a microscope slide. The universe to such a creature consists of only two dimensions, that flat plane of the glass slide. Its senses cannot perceive anything beyond the edges. God meets all needs according to his timetable. And God says to Moses, it's not my time yet. Instead, God reminds uh, uh, Moses of his promises in the same way. And he says, again, he keeps us ignorant because we're incapable of comprehending the answer. So what things? At the very end of the section that we just read, Jesus says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter? His glory. It's perhaps because we don't understand the scriptures. One of the things that I think the New Testament makes very clear, what the coming of Jesus makes very clear, is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. I mean, you think about it this way. Jesus was the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is now imputed to us. Or you think Jesus is the true and better Abel, the one who was innocently slain and his blood uh, cries out. Or Jesus is the true and better Abraham. Or Jesus is the true and better Isaac. Or Jesus is the true and better Jacob. Or Jesus is the true and better Joseph. Or Jesus is the better and true Moses. Or, uh, or Jesus is the true and better Job. Or Jesus is the better and true David. And again, when I read through the scriptures, everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. Everything. I was telling my kids the other day, you look at the ambulance. I mean, even the sign that they, each ambulance has of a, of a stick and, and, a, and a serpent or, or snakes wrapped around that pole. It's actually a prophecy in the Old Testament. It's a sign from the Old Testament about who? About Jesus. And so when, when, the, when the, the disciples are walking this road to Emmaus with Jesus, Jesus is starting to open their eyes and say, hey, all the stuff that you know, all the stuff that you read, all that you've studied in the Old Testament was concerning Jesus. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. A light bulb went off. He began to understand that all of the Old Testament was about Jesus was about Jesus. And then in verse 28, they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted 
this and do a point further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So we, he went in to stay with them, and when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed. And it's appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and he had known, had not, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Jesus uh, dined with his disciples. He broke bread with them. And this is such a, uh, an important part of what we do as a church. It's something that as a church that we do uh, every week because, again, it's, a, it's an encouragement to our soul. I know some believe that it's just a memorial. It's like, ah, I'm, you know, it's a way to remember what Christ did. But for us as, as Presbyterians and as believers of Jesus, we think it's much more. It, it encourages us. It nourishes our spirit. It's a tangible, tangible and physical thing that we touch and we taste and we say, the Lord is good. It's a visible reminder of, of what Christ did for us. He, he broke his body and his blood was spilled on the cross for our sake. To tell us how much he loves us. That though we think that there's a curveball that God has thrown towards us, that the curveball really is, is Jesus coming to save sinners like you and me. This is the banqueting table. This is just a dress rehearsal for the time that we'll spend with the king at, uh, at the king's table dining with him in eternity. My friends, this is the Lord's table. We, uh, uh, when, when you eat of it, when you actually take that piece of bread from the, uh, the plate and you eat it, you're proclaiming something. You're professing something. This is not just a, I'm going to eat it and take it. It's actually a professing of Jesus Christ. You are the Son of God, the one who came and died for me. When you drink the blood, you're saying, Lord, your sin in exchange, uh, I'm sorry, your blood ex uh, uh, in exchange for my sin. That great exchange taking place, you, you see Jesus, um, uh, our sins being imputed to Jesus on the cross. And this unfair exchange of, of Jesus exchanging that sin for his righteousness to you. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we're not coming here uh, before, before uh, the table and saying, uh, I'm going to come when, I, when my life is, is, is perfect, or when I have life figured out. No, it's you come to the table broken and needy and, and realizing your need for a Savior. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ spilled for you. Again, if you are a believer, if you are a professing believer, you can say with integrity, Jesus, my Lord and Savior, my friends, this meal is for you. If you cannot say that with integrity, I would ask that you would refrain from the table. Uh, wait. We would love for you to be at the table with us soon. Uh, I know for sure that there will be enough bread and enough cups when the time comes. My friends, this is the meal of God for the people of God.
night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it and gave it to his disciples. After having given thanks, he said, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. My friends, take and eat. In the same way, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time we take the, we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim his death until he returns. And that's what we're doing. I've always seen communion as a, as a way of, of a countdown calendar, a way of looking at uh, Christ and his coming back for us. It's a countdown calendar because I know that every time we take communion, it's one day closer. It's the time that Jesus comes and returns for his bride. My friends, the blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for this awful exchange, this unfair trade of our sins for your righteousness. God, we thank you that in your love for us, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the body of Christ for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. And we'll close out with our last song of the afternoon, He Will Hold Me Fast, found in your bulletin.
love that sound. <laughs> what an encouragement uh, that it is not how hold, how, how, uh, how, <laughs> I can't find my words to speak. Uh, it's an encouraging that it's not about how uh, fast we hold on to him, but how fast he holds on to us. The essence of the gospel is how much he loves us and what he does for us, and not the strength of our faith, not by the power of, uh, of, uh, of self-will, but all the, the love and, and power that, uh, that he has for us, that he holds us fast. And so with these words, uh, we're sent out with a good word. A benediction basically just means a good word. We're going out as, uh, as those encouraged, those uh, who have uh, eyes enlightened, those who know, those who know what Christ did and what Christ means to us and, and who Christ is to us. And that is power enough. I pray that as you walk out through those doors, that you would be that witness, that you'd be a witness like these two disciples were to the other 11, to the women of the transforming work of Christ in your heart. And so my friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wonderful love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you guys come to think of um, Jake Miller, who is engaged to uh, Moret, he just had a, a death in the family this past weekend. Um, they've had pretty tough few weeks. They've had grandparents pretty much um, who have died every like week uh, mm. for the past like I don't know month or so. And then he had his uncle uh, who passed away this past weekend. So if you guys would pray for them at, at some point during your week this week, I think that'd be appreciating, appreciating that. And uh, please say hi to one another and spend time with each other. And we'll uh, do Sunday school to do membership training um, this afternoon with Pastor Yoon.